Hello and welcome to my studio. I'm Jessie and this is the Knit Up and Die podcast, episode 60, Perspective. As always, I'm going to start out with a whole list of thank yous. Um, I, I love doing this and I appreciate all the feedback and support that I get from you guys. Thank you. Uh, and as always, Warm hello and special thank you go out to all of my subscribers, both new and ongoing. I love you guys. You're the reason I do this, and I appreciate you adding me to your day. Hello and welcome goes out to David, Loretta, Emily, K.L. Johnson, Cindy Lee Crochet, and Lisa. You guys are wonderful. Thank you. Special love and thanks, as always, go out to Tiffany Carol Kath. Jen Lemore Vachon, Marie Linda Bex, Wheezy Cindy, Christy, Neetzi Charlotte, Chris, Roseanne, Linda Marie, Leanne, whew, Eve Linda, David Donna, Betty Ann, Scott and John, Carolyn, Kate, Terry, Nancy, and Rachel. Thank you guys. And a warm hello and thank you go out to my patrons. You guys honor me. Um, we have drawings at the end of this episode, so stay tuned. <laughs> Let's kick in. Um, I have not knit a single stitch in two weeks and counting. Um, very big hugs and love go out to all of my physical therapy brothers and sisters out there. Whether it's your hip, your knee, your elbow, your ankle, your wrist, your what's it. Do your exercises, they're worth it. And your progress may seem small, incremental, but it, it adds up. And I'm getting somewhere, I'm feeling better, the pain's starting to subside, yours will too. And remember the most important exercise of all is the exercise that you're avoiding. And the crucial exercise that you do is the exercise of your attitude, having the right perspective going into this with a goal in mind and keeping up a positive attitude makes all the difference. Exercise your attitude, not just your body. A thousand things. <laughs> um, so I'm still working on my thousand things project. And if you have been following along, you have an idea what I'm talking about. And if not, this is the deal. I'm trying to rid my life of 1,000 things. Things are just things. They're objects in your world, in your life, in your environment that are taking up space that don't have purpose or reason that you can eliminate and streamline your life, streamline your, your visual impact in your home, clutter, get rid of it. It's that kind of a thing. And I set this random goal of I'm getting rid of a thousand things and I am at 763. There's been very little progress, but progress nonetheless. And the garage is coming. The husband has started to collect boxes and he's now saying phrases like, well, when we tackle the garage, we're getting there. I'm very excited about this. Um, and, and he also said something about, oh, we're gonna go way past a thousand when we get into the garage. <laughs> yes, all right. Having him on board makes this even more worthwhile. This is something we're doing together. And now that he's seen that 763 things are gone from our house and they're not missed, I think it's been good for both of us. Moving on, what have I been designing? Um, nothing, because I'm not knitting. I also haven't been typing. Um, I haven't really been at my computer a lot. Those of you that have sent me messages or emails and I haven't responded, I am sorry. I think about it, I feel like I've responded to you, and then I see that message again and I realize I haven't responded. I'm going to get to you, I promise. Um, I, I do take time every weekend to sit down and go through all of my YouTube comments, thank you guys, and actually respond to them. I see them throughout the week, but that doesn't mean that I respond to them. Often because when I see them, I see them on my cell phone. My cell phone is convinced it's smarter than me. It likes to replace words and sometimes in very unfortunate and embarrassing manner. 
predictive text and and autocorrect are nightmares. Nightmares. Um, they they don't work the way my mind does, and so I, I avoid them. I avoid them. That and typing like this is not good for my shoulder. Um, but I will get to you. I promise. Please do not take offense if I have not responded to you. It is not personal to you. It is personal to me and my shoulder. Um, I, I have Botruckel ready to release. I just need to sit down and do that action in, in my laptop and on Ravelry for you. I've been dying. Um, I did get some yarn dyed last weekend and I am dying some today. I have a demo for you guys. Yes. My husband has been wonderful and he has actually been quite the enforcer that I'm not lifting things over my head, that I'm not carrying heavy equipment. He has been wonderful and he's really been helpful so that I can make the magic happen in the pots without having to be a heavy weight lifter. So I'm super grateful to him and uh, I, I'm still able to do what I love and that's important. So let's pop into the kitchen and let's dye some yarn. Welcome to my kitchen. So I have a sock blank dyeing demonstration for you today, but I want to start out by doing some yarn prep demonstration. I got some mail this week from Christy, who didn't do all the steps necessary before she dyed her yarn, and that cost her a lot of time, frustration, and effort. One of the things that we need to do is prepare our yarns prior to dyeing them. When we receive our bases, often they have some initial ties in place but it's very important to add additional ties to our yarns, especially if we're going to kettle dye them. When we kettle dye them, our yarns are floating around in water and they can turn into spaghetti. Having extra ties in place makes all the difference in your time and effort and makes it easier not only to manipulate the yarn in the pot and out of the pot, but to wind up that yarn later on. Let's Pull in close here and I'm going to show you how I tie my yarns before I dye them. The very first thing I do when I receive my bases is I inspect them. I want to look at the yarn overall to see if I see any breaks, to see if I see any dirt, to see if I see any oils built up on them. I want to see if there's any smudges and I want to see if there's any damage from shipping or possibly from moths and other bugs. Fortunately, I have never had a problem with my base supplier. It has always been quality and I've never had an issue with it. The second thing I do when I get my yarn is I lay it all out and I tie it. I use just a cotton twine and I listed the supplier in my last episode. Let me grab the cone to show you. I buy twine in bulk. I'm not even kidding. I buy a great big spool of cotton twine. This spool cost me, gosh, I think under $10, and it's going to last me a long, long time. I cut that into 12-inch lengths for tying my, my bases up to just keep everything organized in the dye pot. It's an extra step, but it's well worth it, worth every dime. It is an extra expense, but it's going to save you a ton of effort later on. I get mine at... Oh, I'm trying to think of it. I'll have the link here for you. <laughs> I'm drawing a total blank. But it is, it's a quality product and it holds up beautifully in the dye pots. Also, because it's cotton, it doesn't take on the acid dyes, so it stands out white in my dye pot and I can easily grab it to move my yarns around. 12 inch length. I find a section of yarn that's well organized. I lay it over the top, I break in between the, the grouping, and I pull it through. I twist this around once, and I push that back down through, and grab it underneath. I take these two, and I dye, tie a quick knot, just like that. So I've got a loose figure eight around my yarn. I do that in three or four places. 
you can see where my supplier has tie lines in place. They're very loose and sometimes they are tying the ends together as well. This one's just a tie line. Let me find the end grouping for you. Here's the end grouping. You can see there's four lines coming together here. If I pick this up, by this tie out of my pot, I'm pulling on the ends that are part of this line as well, and I'm disorganizing my entire grouping. I want to look for spaces between their ties and tie down again. And again, I lay it over the whole thing. I reach through the middle. Anywhere, really. It doesn't have to be exact. I twist it around at least once, pass it back through, come under the under other half, and then knot it. And I'm not doing this tight. I'm doing it loose so that that yarn can move around. If you do it too tightly, you're going to end up with a resist in place, and then the dye won't get on the yarn there. I generally find that three times is sufficient per skein. That's that. Now I have a nice, tidy, organized skein that's ready for the dye pot, and if I drop it in a ton of water, it looks like spaghetti, but I know that it's a nice organized grouping still that I can readily sort out. No knots, easy winding, easy caking. Sock blanks are different. With sock blanks, we don't have to do any tying prep. If you choose to do tying prep, you can do it as a resist method. Works great. It's a lot like tie-dyeing. That's why they call it tie-dyeing, because you tie it and then you dye it. Today's sock blank demonstration is really more about perspective. <laughs> That's the title of this episode and I'm sticking to it. For my method today, I'm using my roasting pan. My sock blank has been soaking in a citric acid mixture of one-third cup citric acid to one gallon of water dissolved for about three hours now. Time is really about saturation. One hour can be sufficient. In my dry environment, I like to go longer simply because those fibers are really, really dried out and I need more time for the moisture to saturate all the way through the fiber, especially where it's pre-knit. You've got some areas there that aren't really getting good exposure because they're pre-knit. I just give them more time. I'm going to go ahead and grab my sock blank out of my citric acid mixture with gloves on. Okay, so I have my sock blank. I wrung it out just enough to get it across the room without it dripping, and now I'm going to lay it out in my pan. The way that I lay it out is going to be important to how it dies. I want to lay it out like a picture frame, like a big donut in the middle of my pan, with room on the outside and a hole on the inside. Let me get that organized and then I'll show you. And it is all scrunched up, it's not going to lay out flat. We want it to be scrunched up. That scrunched up aspect of it is part of the resist method that's going to give us the interest in the blending that we're looking for. The reason that I'm choosing this particular method is because of the effect it's going to have on the yarn. Obviously, that's why we do all these different methods. For this particular effect, what's happening is the dye is going to be one color on the outside edge of the sock blank and another color on the inside edge of the sock blank. What this does, because the sock blank is knit back and forth, is it gives us a color on either outside edge, so that when you're knitting it, you get a stripe of one color that lasts longer, a section in the middle that's a blend or has other interesting elements to it, and then a color on the other end that you're going through and back into, so that you get a section of both of those colors really strong and the variance in between. Interesting for striped projects. For socks, it'll make really neat spirals around the sock. So I've got this laid out for you, and I'm just gonna tilt it up and show you. We have a donut. There's room around the outside of the pan. There's a scrunched up sock blank in the middle, and there's room in the inside of the sock blank. That's where I'm applying the dye, in the outside void and the inside void. 
and I'm using different dyes, they coordinate together or are contrasting depending on what effect we're getting. I'm going to take a second here and mix up my dye. Always wear a mask. Okay, so what am I doing for dye? I'm mixing up about a cup and a half of dye for each of these. I've been on a real beachy kick this week where I'm thinking a lot about surf and sand and warm weather. Clearly, I'm wearing fleece. I'm cold. So I'm doing a lot of blues and sandy browns and teals, just colors that I enjoy. I have mixed up two cups of a tealy blue and a cup and a half, two cups, and a sandy brown. I'm going to take that sandy brown and I'm going to start to pour it just in the middle of the donut. I'm not pouring it onto the yarn, I'm pouring it into the void of the yarn. And it's going to bleed through underneath, that's okay. I'm only pouring about half of the, my dye in initially. Then I'm taking the other color and I'm pouring it around the outside. Again, I'm not pouring it onto the yarn, I'm pouring it into the pan around the outside. Very careful that if it does dribble, it's dribbling again into that void and not directly onto the yarn. The reason for this is I want it to bleed through. I want it to pick up around that outside edge and only on the bits that are contacting the pan. There's a much bigger area here so I have a lot more room to pour. And I'm going to pour out all of that dye. It's all out. In the meantime, what was in the middle has been soaking in and now there's more room. I didn't want a huge pool of dye initially. I wanted enough so it start to dye in and have room. If I pour it too deep in the middle, it's going to bleed through too quickly and I won't have time to get the outside struck with the other dye color in such a way that it has a contrast and not a true bleed. Now I'm just going to pour the rest of it into that void. And it's all in. I'm going to grab the camera, I'm going to tilt it down and show you what I'm seeing. Here's my yarn pan. You can see that I've got a sandy brown in the middle and I've got the tealy blue around the outside. And there's big wrinkles and folds that are not getting any dye at all yet. The rest of what you do at this point is nuance. You can poke it, you can prod it, you can blend it all you want. It's about you and your taste and what you want your final outcome to be. Generally what I do is I start tapping the yarn in the folds down from the inside working toward the outside of the frame. This just gives it a little bit more contact. I swish it around a little bit. And because my inner color is really pale, I really want to make sure that that gets good contact. So I'm making more of an effort here to contact the center color than I am the outer color because that teal is really bright and strong. To that end, if I do see areas that are going to be really big and underexposed, I will tap them in as well. Once I'm satisfied with the overall look of it, knowing full well that it's going to bleed a little bit more in the oven, I go ahead and I get this loaded to my oven at 225 degrees for about 20 minutes. I'm looking to see that the dye bath exhausts, that the fluid in the actual dye bath ends up clear all the way around and all the way through. Into the oven we go. Here's another sock blank that I've applied the exact same technique to. The colors here are a lot closer. They're not as contrasting and this is why I didn't show you this one initially. I wanted to show you something that you could readily see the color differences. This one's been in the oven already and there's big areas that are still really white and my dye bath hasn't completely exhausted. There's still color in the water here. I'm just going to move this around a little bit to give the dye more opportunity to get into the folds and the cracks here and take up the rest of the way. Now 
These little white folds are going to add so much interest to your projects because they're going to be really, really random. It also provides me an opportunity to do the airbrushing or stenciling and really make this a unique piece that pops. So because these take so long in the dye bath and because I've got so much more I want to show you, I'm going to show you an end product, a sock blank that I already dyed using this method. Let me see if I can get a really good shot of this for you. Let me get out so you can see what happens. This sock blank was dyed by the same method. If I unfold it, you're going to start to see there's a lighter blue and a darker blue. By having it all scrunched up, I got all these amazing voids in here that I went black, back and I airbrushed detail into. It just makes it really, really interesting because now I have sections of dark that I'm going to come out across and back into when I knit, and I have sections of light that I'm going to go out across and back into and make really interesting spiraling effects in a sock project. These voids are what you can just add all kinds of detail and interest to and really make it your own. Like I've said a hundred times before, this is art. Even if you had the exact same recipe, your folds, your creases, your wrinkles in your sock blank are going to make your work totally unique from anybody else's. And how you enhance that design by stenciling or airbrushing or whatever else you do to it, even scribbling on this, makes this so unique and so amazing. Play with it. Have fun. Add multiple techniques. And we're back. Hopefully that is something that you'll be able to play with, another technique that will work for you or give you a jumping off point to your own creativity. We love that. Moving on to studio enhancements. Um, I have on order a book. It's not here yet. Uh, supposedly it'll be here Wednesday. I really hope it gets here soon. I'd, I'd want to sit down and read it. Um, it's knitting comfortably, the ergonomics of hand knitting, and I'm excited about that because it really addresses posture. And part of the reason I'm not knitting, and, and this is going to sound kind of myopic and ridiculous, is that I'm aware I have some bad habits. I have some bad posture habits, and those are part of what's contributing to my pain. By giving myself time off, I'm hoping to break a little bit of my muscle memory, and I know this isn't going to be wildly successful. It's, it's an attempt. I want to break a little bit of my muscle memory so that I get this book, I read this book, I employ these new techniques, and then I start knitting again so that I'm working under new framework, under new postures, and can permanently bust this issue. Uh, it's a plan. <laughs> it's a plan. Uh, hopefully this is, I, I, I feel like I'm on the right path, that I'm at least aware of the problems and I'm trying to address the problems. That's, that's the biggest chunk. I admit I have a problem. Now I can move forward. Let's dig into business talk. You guys have been great. I so appreciate the feedback and the appreciation you've expressed that I am still providing a really helpful, useful podcast product to you by discussing business even when I can't show you things. Thank you. Um, it is a concern to me. I do push very hard to make sure that the podcast has interesting content every week that is not just my fuddy-duddy life about the thousand things I'm trying to get rid of. Um, but that also has some value either to your personal life or to your professional life. So thank you for your support. Um, I, I, I got an interesting message this week from another dyer such as yourself. She's asked to remain anonymous. Um, who's, who's starting her own indie dye company. And she asked me, can I call myself a professional yarn dyer? Yes. Um, that is really about the definition of professional. And I know that some people struggle with that definition. And so 
let's let's look at what professional means. If you look up in a dictionary, if you look up online, the definition of professional, they will say, it says, the following, an occupation, there we go, as a means of livelihood or for gain. What does that mean? That means if you dye yarn and you sell one skein of yarn, you are now a professional yarn dyer. You have done it for gain. There's no extra credentials that you need. There's no special degree that you need. You only have to follow the occupation for gain. You are a professional yarn dyer. Use the title. Professional also has other definitions, and this is important. Exhibiting a courteous, conscientious, and generally business-like manner in the workplace or community. That's important. Um, you can be an amazing dyer. You can have gorgeous, gorgeous supply. But if you treat other people badly, if you are discourteous, if you are rude, if you speak ill of others, if you are abrasive and abusive to your community, you won't be a professional for long. You will not continue to gain from it. Um, there's a reason that professional covers both the act of gaining monetarily from it and manner. They are hand in hand. How you are perceived, if you behave professionally or unprofessionally, will impact your bottom line. Um, and, and you can be professional without being stuffy. You can be casual. You can be fun. But it's about having that filter in place to know when is the right time to say something and when is inappropriate to say things. Um, it's a struggle sometimes. Sometimes it is. I know I have put my foot squarely in my mouth. I know that I have said things that other people might have found offensive. But as a professional, I continue to strive to do better. And that's important as well. Always trying to do better, whether you're trying to make a prettier yarn, whether you're trying to provide better customer service, whether you're trying to learn more, all of it is important. Striving to move forward is important. Um, to that end, <laughs> I also received some messages this week uh, that were very thankful to me for the information that I supply you guys. Thank you. Um, I, I believe strongly in building this community. I believe strongly in sharing my knowledge. And I believe very strongly that dyeing yarn, designing patterns, these are art forms. We are artists. And what we develop, what we do, is art. It is unique. It comes from within us. And I often will refer back to Toll House cookies. <laughs> Toll House chocolate chip morsels have a recipe on the back, the Toll House cookie. And the Toll House cookie, you could come to my house. We could both stand in my kitchen. We could use the same measuring spoons. We could use the exact same ingredients. We can use the same oven. Something's going to be different about our batches. Something's going to be different. There's a magic. It's the love you put into it. There's always a variance. Whether I stirred it one time more than you did, or you softened your butter just a second longer, there's an art to these things, and they're going to be different. And that's the beauty. That's the, the thing that we embrace about being human is that we're all different. Same with yarn. Same with dyeing yarn. It's all different. If I give you my exact same formula with the same base, with the same dyes, we're still going to make different yarn. Yay! <laughs> Yay! 
Um, however, there are other dyers out there who feel that this industry is highly competitive or, and I mean to a cutthroat level apparently, um, and they don't want to share information about their, about their sources. Okay. Um, that is their prerogative. Absolutely. We all have choices in how we conduct our business. However, um, like I said, professional is so much more than monetary gain. It's really about operating with our, our community and supporting our community. Supporting our community is bigger than just me helping one other dyer. It's more than me helping multiple other dyers. It's helping our suppliers as well. Um, it's understanding the impact of an old saying that you keep your friends close and you keep your enemies closer. If you want to believe that this industry is competitive, if you want to believe that it is cutthroat competitive, you want to keep your competitors close to you. You want discourse between you. You want to share information. Um, we only gain from learning what our competitor is doing. To that end, <laughs> um, I'm really kind of embarrassed by bad behavior in our industry. When I see other dyers be rude or harsh to people who want to learn, I, f I find that embarrassing. I find it an act of unprofessionalism that hurts us all. It hurts us all. And I, I get it. I'm totally on a soapbox here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But if it helps you think differently about your business, good. If it brings you more monetary gain and more people that you network with for information, good. It's worth being on this box. Um, it's important to remember, and I, I have notes here. I, I thought about this before I brought this to you. It's important to remember that if you work in a vacuum, you suffocate, interact with people. By hearing who I use as a supplier, by hearing how I produce my product, by hearing where I get my ribbons, my ties, my labels, my business cards, my yarn stock, you're learning also who I'm not using. And that may be because I'm not aware of them or because there was a problem with them or because the pricing was better. You're still learning and that learning helps you build your business. Um, also, <laughs> by sharing our suppliers, we build their businesses. My supplier was somebody that was already on my radar and it was somebody that when I talked to my mentors about, they agreed that they used them as well. They gave me references for somebody who was already on my radar because they advertised. If you look in the back of any, any knitting magazine, you're going to see suppliers of yarn bases. They're advertising for a reason. They're in business. They're trying to make money as well. And by providing them with more business. It gives them the ability to purchase in bulk. When they purchase in bulk, it gives them the ability to negotiate better rates. Just last week, I told you guys that I was bringing in a big shipment of base yarns because there's going to be a supply increase. The price increase is going up because wool is in fashion. Yay! However, because my supplier is a big supplier, because they have a lot of business from other indie dyers, they have been able to forecast, they have been able to purchase in bulk, and they have been able to negotiate rates and keep them down 
longer than many other suppliers. By me sharing who my supplier is with other dyers such as you, we built their business, we kept their prices down, and we kept our prices down. Ask me anything. I'm going to tell you who I use because I want to keep my stock prices as low as possible for as long as possible so that my retail price out to my buyers such as possibly you is lower longer so that I can sell more. It's business. <laughs> it's business. Um, I'm all for building our industry. I really am. And finally, I, I'm going to step off the box in just a minute, I promise. If, if you're already like, I've had enough of this. Um, we don't suffer colors that we don't enjoy because we are in love with the base that a particular dyer uses. We buy yarn based on the visual impact of it and the hand, the, the material of it. But I won't continue to buy colors that I don't like simply because of the base somebody uses. I'll find a color I love and then I'll find the project that works with it. Keep that in mind. Produce yarn that you love and other people will love it too. And be kind to the people you work with. To that end, <laughs> I'm off the box, I'm off the box. Um, I, I hope that my experiences in my business that I share with you help you build your business. So, I have, I, I have somebody that I work with who has done me great benefit. And this is outside of knitting, completely outside of knitting. Uh, a wonderful gentleman that I would like to make a gift in thanks for. Um, he's a, an older than me gentleman. He is not a knitter. However, he has very fond memories of his mother's knitting. And I think that it would be a very um, meaningful gift if I gave him something that I hand knit. I am appealing to you folks for help. Um, I don't have the option of knitting quite yet. It's coming and I do have time before the gift needs to be done. There's not a, a definitive timeline on it. But I'm struggling with what to knit as a gift. This person doesn't wear hats. This person doesn't wear scarves. This person is not of an intimate enough relationship for me to be asking him about his foot size and ultimately I'd like it to be a surprise. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking more either a decor object or um, a, a, a gift object. I, I just know that a hat would be wasted. I know that a scarf would be wasted. I know that gloves and mittens would be wasted. I live in the Southwest. Um, our, our weather is rarely warm enough that men get really excited about wearing heavy, woolly gifts. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what to do. I'm not sure what to do. He is aware of what I do and he has a great appreciation for the yarns that I create, the patterns that I design. Um, but to that end, I, I've never seen him wear anything knitted. He's spoken of things that his mother made in the past and how his appreciation for them has grown since she's gone. So I, I'm appealing to you guys for ideas and I would love to hear from you as to what you feel like a man in his 60s would have use of an appreciation of that is a knitted gift. Please. Bring it. I, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and and I, I'm open to all kinds of madness, so bring it. <laughs> what have I been doing when I haven't been analyzing business and, and tying yarn and, and throwing dye at it? Well, I'm still doing my beading. 
and I um, am really actually enjoying that time out. Like I said in the past, it's very slow and methodical. Um, I won't be giving demonstrations of beading here. Thank you for asking. It's very sweet of you. Um, it, it's just not it's not something I demonstrate because it's it's so haphazard, <laughs> really. I, I don't really plan what I do. I just listen to the object and I do whatever feels right next. However, I do show my beaded object, so I'm going to show you a little peek of what I've been working on. This is my whip for the week. I started a new doll, and uh, I showed you last week the one that I finished. This is the newest one and what I've been doing on her. I'm going to stab the needle into the back instead of into her front so it looks a little bit less violent. This is my newest doll. She has such a pretty face. I just love this face cabochon. And so far I've only just beaded down the length of her body. And she has kind of a unique shape. Every one of my dolls is completely new and different. I cut each one of them out different. Um, I do have a... I make a paper template. I free draw and then I use a paper template to create it, but I don't often reuse my templates. In fact, I don't think I've ever reused a template. I think I've referenced them for certain shapes for other dolls, but I've never reused one. So this is my current doll. She is yet unnamed as well, but she is slowly making progress. And this is quite literally a week's worth of work. The doll had already been sewn, but the beading, that's, that's what I did in my evenings this week. You thought knitting was slow. <laughs> Beating can take a long time. Um, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. And I'm really appreciating the opportunity to use some of my calico collection. I, I have a lot of cotton yarns and batik yarns and quilting yarns. Sam, fabrics. They're fabrics. Um, batik fabric, batik cottons and, and quilting fabrics. Um, I, I appreciate digging back into those and seeing the colors that I've bought over the years. I have a little mini stash. And digging into my bead stash, that has been great fun. I forget what's in there because sometimes I will be months before I go back and look at what's in there. And with each doll I get to develop a whole new color scheme and a whole new palette of what beads I'm choosing. And I will often go back and dig through the stash again and find something else. It's a lot like having a project that utilizes minis because I'm using very small quantities of lots of different things. I wish I could knit the same way I bead. I, I wish that I could incorporate small bits of yarn into my projects and have an appreciation for it. I often look at it and go, yeah, no, that, that doesn't work. Uh, we do what we do. Finally this week, I would love to uh, again come back to thanking my Patreons. If you don't know about my Patreon page, please have a visit and consider offering your support. I have, in this downtime from knitting, really been thinking about the class that I want to film and put up for my, my patrons, and I've been slowly developing how much, how involved that's going to be and what it's going to be. I have a class in mind. It is for a hat pattern that I designed several years ago that uses a number of different techniques, including an interesting construction. And I am tempted to have the class go all the way from dyeing the yarn to knitting the project so that you have the opportunity to start from the very beginning and dye your own yarn for this project. Um, if you have interest in that or opinions, ideas, thoughts, weigh in. I'd love to hear from you. It's drawing time. <laughs> um, the patronage has benefits at every level. Thank you guys for your support. The reason for the patronage is to get the funding necessary to be able to film classes and make them available to you. With the patronage starting out as early as it is, chances are very high on the drawing levels that you'll be one of our winners. And the next drawing is going to be April 7th. I'm going to grab my cell phone real quickly so I can look up 
random.org. It's there. And we're going to draw some winners. Okay, got my phone. I've got random.org pulled up. For my benefactor level, I have two people. Those two people, you got a 50% chance of winning this. The benefactor level says uh, that once a month I'll do a random drawing and you receive a special knitted gift inclusive of yarn pattern and more. Because I have one and two, I'm entering one and two, I'm hitting generate. My result is number one, and number one is Betty Ann. Betty Ann, you're getting this month's prize. Circle that one off. At my partner level, uh, you receive, there's a random drawing once a month where you receive a skein of Dye Monkey Yarns, hand dyed yarn, and a pattern of your choosing. Again, this one is between one and two. And I have drawn number one again. High stakes here. And that is Charlotte. Charlotte, you won this month's partner level drawing. Finally, in the drawing levels, I have my contributor level. Let's get that set up. And the contributor level receives a random skein of yarn from Dye Monkey Hand Dyed Yarns. And I have three people at this level. Let's go ahead and get that set up. Hit generate. And the winner at this level is number three. And that is Kath. Kath, you get it. Yay, we have winners. Betty Ann, Charlotte, and Kath, I'll be getting those prepped for you. Um, Charlotte, please contact me and let me know what skein of yarn out of my Etsy shop and what of my design, my patterns, you would like to receive, and I'll get that right out to you. Finally, at the non-drawing level, at the you get it level, the subscription level comes with big benefits. Um, each month, all subscription level patrons receive a 100 grand skein of the hand dyed fingering weight yarn in an exclusive colorway that is not available any other way, um, and a 25% discount to all of my products for the whole month. Your contribution, if you are at subscription level, is less than the cost of a monthly soft yarn club and comes with bigger benefits, so do consider it. And I'm putting out my spoiler alert right now. Spoiler alert! This is the yarn for subscription level for this month. I gave you a sneak peek last week. It was still wet. Here it is in all of its glory this week. Making sure that the light is not glaring too much. And I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to describe it. If you wanted this to be a surprise, look away. There it is. I'm very excited about this. I think it's beautiful. I've tucked it away. You are welcome to look back. That's it. That's all, guys. Um, I hope you hung in there with me. I, I, I feel kind of like I was... I feel very passionately about conducting business in a professional manner. And I feel very passionately about building this industry and sharing with other people. And I feel very passionately about people that are rude when they don't do so. Be polite, be good to people, keep a good perspective on your goals, and have an open perspective about other people's goals as well. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time. Bye.